good morning and welcome to Hope Hospice's Town Hall series. I'm Debbie Emerson, Hope's community health educator and certified dementia specialist. I've been with Hope for six years now uh, as the facilitator of our family caregiver education series. Uh, in addition to my training and experience as a health educator, I have more than 10 years of experience as a family caregiver. So my goal is to bring to you to you presentations that combine my professional and personal experiences as I share with you what I hope is valuable information about all aspects of providing care for those we love. The Town Hall webinar series is a new limited series that Hope Hospice began offering this past June and will continue through the end of October. Prior to COVID, we were able to go into the community to care facilities, businesses, and organizations, senior living facilities, doing health fairs, and we would provide education and training on a variety of topics pertaining to seniors in our community. Since we're unable to do that now, due to all of the efforts towards getting this pandemic under control, we're now offering many of the same presentations virtually in webinar format. In a moment, I'll talk about some of our upcoming webinars. But first, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Gia Barcel, who will be team teaching with me today. Gia? Debbie, uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for logging in with us today. I am Hope Hospice's Manager of Dementia Services and Community Education. I'm a Tipa Snow Certified Dementia Consultant and Trainer. And my job is to help educate families and care providers who are navigating dementia, as well as to help come up with non-pharmacological ways of working through behaviors. My goal is to create an environment where we have a care team in place that supports everyone involved to the best of their abilities. Quality person-centered care is our goal. As well as doing educational seminars with Debbie, I also provide dementia consultations so that we can come up with a plan for individual care. I think that's about it, so let's get started. Okay. So first of all, for a complete listing of upcoming webinars, please visit our website, um, hopehospice.com. And just a quick clarification about our two webinar programs. The Family Caregiver Education Series has topics specific to family caregivers, including those who are caring for a loved one with dementia. This is an ongoing program, and as I mentioned, we're in our sixth year, um, and we have webinars every month, usually on the second Thursday of the month. And a complete listing can be found on our website. Now, our Town Hall Webinar Series is a limited program that we're offering this fall. And this program is designed for a broader audience, anyone who's interested in topics relating to senior care in general. And as you can see, there's some crossover, but the bottom line is you can choose to attend whatever webinars interest you. So the next webinar is next week on September 24th. Uh, Terry Stoll, Hope's registered dietitian, will do a presentation about diabetes for the town hall webinar series. And then at our family caregiver webinar on October 15th, Julie Fiedler from Horizon Elder Law will do a presentation about what we need to do to get legal affairs in order for ourselves and for those for whom we provide care. Julie has been kind enough to share her knowledge and expertise with us over the past five years. She's one of our favorite presenters. On Wednesday, October 21st at 10 a.m., I'll, I'll be presenting a town hall webinar on Tipa Snow's GEMS State. So using this GEMS state's cognitive model, we can focus more on what our person living with dementia can do in certain, in certain stages, as opposed to focusing on what they can't do. Again, please visit Hope Hospice's webinar, website for a complete list of webinars and to register for any webinar that we've spoken about today. So we've all been sheltering in place, we've been isolating, and we've been quarantining for several months now. How has this impacted our ability to function? Imagine what it would be like if you no longer had the ability to understand what was going on. What if you weren't able to try to figure out how to adapt to the changes and the changes to the changes? What if you were unable to follow the new rules? What do we do? Well, according to Tipa Snow, renowned dementia guru, 
care providers are now being asked to do the impossible with the inadequate. And I agree with her. Today we'll talk about how COVID has changed the care that our loved ones are experiencing and how we can adapt to those changes. We'll break it down by what's happening in the person living with dementia's brain. And then we'll talk about what we can do to give the best possible care given these new circumstances. Lastly, Debbie and I never do a presentation without bringing up how important self-care is. So if you've attended one of our webinars before, once again, you're gonna hear us say, self-care is one of the most important things that you can do to provide quality care for your loved ones. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Dementia basics. We thought it would be a really good idea to start with just some basic information about dementia to kind of catch everybody up. For most of you, this is going to be a quick review, so bear with us. We did do, by the way, a 90-minute webinar on Dementia Basics on September 10th, and a recording of this webinar is listed on our website. The, uh, let's see, is the website listed on there? It's, oh yes, up at the top of your screen where it says Dementia Basics, there's the website that you can find our Dementia Basics webinar, and it'll also be in your resources at the end of this presentation. So, first and foremost, dementia is an umbrella term used to describe a range of progressive neurological disorders or symptoms that affect the brain. There are actually over 200 subtypes of dementia, but the most common are Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, Lewy bodies dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. One thing all dementias have in common is that they are not curable. In dementia, we know that the left side of the brain usually deteriorates first, which affects short-term memory, language skills, and some other things. But it becomes especially challenging to communicate and decipher what the person living with dementia is trying to tell us about their needs. It becomes our job to read behaviors in order to provide the care that they require. Okay. So it's important to remember that while all dementias have many factors in common, each presents differently and has its own pattern of progression. And most importantly, every individual with dementia is unique. However, I'd like to quickly share with you some of the typical ways that dementia can impact the functioning of the brain, our body's command center that ultimately controls every aspect of our thinking and our behavior. As Gia just mentioned with dementia, we tend to first see declines in memory and language. And with language, we're looking at both our ability to understand and our ability to speak. The person with dementia's vocabulary will diminish and they'll begin to rely on simple, familiar words. Or if they can't remember the name of an object, they may describe it. Their sentences may ramble and their meaning may be incoherent. They may lose their ability to understand complex sentence structure and may struggle understanding our questions and our instructions. The memory center of the brain is hit early and hard, um, usually short-term memory at first. They're unable to process and store newly learned information, yet are we able to remember many things from their past, information that's been stored in long-term memory all over the brain. Memories that are associated with emotions and emotional connections do tend to remain until the very end. With regard to reasoning and judgment impairments, persons with dementia have difficulty understanding cause and effect and logic. They struggle with simple problem solving. They may be unable to understand another's point of view. By the way, they are always right and we are always wrong. And as care partners, we need to accept that and try not to argue or convince. They may be unable to separate important from unimportant facts and details. Dementia impairs decision-making, especially in new situations and those involving personal safety, such as cooking and driving. Some behave in socially inappropriate ways due to a loss of inhibitions. They may say and do things that seem totally out of character for them. Their social filters may have lost their effectiveness and their ability to control their impulses may be diminished. Now, abstract thinking 
involves our highest level of cognitive abilities and thought processing. These abilities, along with judgment and reasoning, are located in our frontal lobes, which is one of the last areas of the brain to fully develop, and one of the first areas to be attacked by dementia. The person with dementia may struggle with concepts of time and money. They may no longer be able to manage their own finances. They need specific, concrete examples and instructions. Sarcasm, irony, figures of speech may be completely lost on them. Now, attention refers to our ability to focus, pay attention, stay on task, and multitask. Those with dementia may become easily distracted. And this can impact their ability to complete tasks, even really familiar ones like following a favorite recipe. They may become overwhelmed and overstimulated in large groups or noisy environments because they have difficulty sorting out important information from background noise. They can't focus on what's important. Dementia can also impact vision. The person's field of vision becomes progressively more narrow as peripheral vision is gradually lost and they're only able to see what is right in front of them. The person may be able to discriminate or tell the difference between two similar objects or two objects of the same color. So for example, sometimes the person with dementia is unable to see that there are mashed potatoes on a white plate. The ability to detect motion is diminished as is depth perception. Now, perception refers to our ability to interpret sensations, visual, auditory, taste, and smell that are in our environment. And perception relies on our ability to make judgments about based on experience and our expectations. And by the way, all of this relies on memory. So uh, for, for example, most of us can tell the difference between a car screeching to a stop and a child screaming in distress, primarily because we're aware of the context of the situation. And we can make a judgment based on logic that there's not a child in danger. And then lastly, most people don't realize that motor skills are impacted by dementia. Those with dementia may have difficulty with fine motor skills requiring dexterity, such as getting dressed, shaving, writing, and using utensils. And in end-stage dementia, we see a loss of ability to chew and to swallow. When our large motor abilities are affected, we see impairments in balance and coordination, increasing the risk for falls. And of course, I need to note that our, the aging process in general affects all of our motor skills, um, but dementia accelerates this decline. So when we say that dementia isn't just about memory loss, this is what we mean. Dementia will ultimately affect every part of the brain. So G and I just condensed a 90 minute class into a few minutes. So if you're interested in a more detailed explanation, as Gia just mentioned, she and I did a webinar on dementia basics last week and a recording of that webinar and all of the supplemental material are posted on HOPE's website. But because today we're looking at life in the COVID world and how it, and how it is especially debilitating for the person with dementia, we thought it was really important to give you a brief tour of the brain that's been affected by dementia. But while dementia robs the person of so many important abilities, there are some remaining abilities. And in dementia care, it's essential that we focus on what remains more so than on what is lost. Uh, it really, really is essential. So persons living with dementia retain the ability to interpret nonverbal cues for a long time into the disease. So facial expressions, and tone of voice help us to show what we're trying to express when we can't rely on our words being understood anymore. Unfortunately, with the necessity of wearing masks, like with during COVID, we're especially hindered. Using more gestures like miming and hand motions may be helpful. It's important to note that persons living with dementia still feel emotions, fear, anxiety, happiness, love, etc. 
They just can't verbally express it accurately anymore. As I said earlier, it's up to us to be detectives, to figure out what they're feeling and to show them that we understand when they're feeling angry or frightened or whatever they're feeling. It's additionally our job to then find a way to help them through these emotions and to reassure. The survival instinct known as the fight, fright, flight response also remains long into dementia. This automatic response is a physiological reaction that occurs in response to a perceived threat, either physical or emotional. When we move too fast into a person's field of vision, we can startle them and they may react instinctually by hitting or yelling. How would you feel if someone suddenly appeared in your line of sight, dressed in a gown, mask, gloves, and a face shield? You might think an alien has come to take you away and you might respond accordingly which is not a good thing for anyone involved. Because of where long-term memories are stored in the brain, the person living with dementia also tends to retain them longer. You may hear your loved ones say that they need to get outside to get their chores on the farm done on time before school starts. In that moment, they're living back in the time when they were young and no amount of arguing will convince them that they're actually 95 years old living in a care home in Dublin. What we can do is join them in their reality and then gently redirect them to another activity whenever we have the opportunity, of course. Lastly, it's important to note that the person living with dementia can still connect with rhythm. And when I say rhythm, I don't only mean music. I also mean the rhythm of language, such as poetry and prayer. Sometimes just the sound of words that flow together said by a familiar voice can bring on very, very reassuring feelings. So talking about what's critical to dementia care, what is imperative to providing quality person-centered care? We need to focus on making connections and we can't rely on the usual way we're used to doing this, not only pre-dementia, but pre-COVID restrictions our relationships become even more important. And it's not as simple as telling someone, take some deep breaths, calm down, it'll be okay. In these circumstances, these suggestions probably won't work. We need to find some creative ways to reassure, provide distractions and engage our loved ones. A few simple ways care partners can do this are by slowing down, and by being aware. Use fewer words. Remember, persons living with dementia can only understand about one in every four words that you say. Think about that, one in every four words. That's tough. Provide as much familiarity and routine as possible. And as we're going to keep harping on, Take care of yourself so that you can be fresh and best able to care for your loved one. The inability of the person living with dementia to express their distress, discomfort, or pain is problematic under normal circumstances. The caregiver needs to learn how to interpret their behaviors in order to understand what's going on. But at a time when we are all hyper-concerned about getting COVID, and while we're all highly cognizant of signs and symptoms of COVID, it's more important than ever to be watching for any potential indicators that the person living with dementia has become affected, infected, sorry. We need to watch for fever, coughing, and breathing distress. And when we see any of these symptoms, we need to seek med medical advice. Whenever you sense that something isn't right, contact your care provider. Routines have changed. Things that persons living with dementia used to do are most likely curtailed. People they interacted with may no longer be around. Find ways to ensure that their entire routine hasn't been disrupted. Maybe try and organize ways for people who can no longer be there in person, connect with them through FaceTime, Zoom, or if they're able, maybe they can hear their voice through a phone call. 
Changing rules. Wow, this is hard for us too. Continuing to try to keep things simple is key. Your instructions, the language you use. And don't forget to continue to use visual cues and prompts whenever possible. So back to masks. There are a couple of issues that arise when we're wearing masks. Masks may disrupt effective communication. Not only with the voice being mumbled because you're wearing a mask, but also one of the primary ways we communicate with someone who has dementia is by using nonverbal strategies. So that includes facial expressions and smiles. Masks mask all of that. Masks can also cause fear and confusion. The person living with dementia may not be able to recognize the wearer, even if that person is familiar to them. Their fear may trigger aggression, resistance, and possibly even agitation, especially if the mask wearer is trying to help them with personal care. I can see the fight, flight, fright response being triggered in a lot of these types of potential situations. So touch. Those with dementia require more physical touch. They like physical contact in the way of gentle, reassuring touches and hugs. Additionally, not only may they be more inclined to touch everything, including other people, they won't remember that it's not safe to do so. It's even hard for us without dementia to contend with not to remember to touch our own faces. Remember, the sense of touch is one of the basic ways that humans explore and interact with their environment. See if you can find ways to touch things that are comforting that aren't putting anyone in danger. So continuing on touch, those with dementia may, may require more physical contact in the way of gentle reassuring hugs, but we're supposed to be social distancing. We need to stay six feet away apart from each other in order to stay safe. That's not natural for us. And additionally, a person living with dementia most likely won't be able to understand why we're keeping our distance or why we're preventing them from getting close to us. So social isolation has an even greater impact on those with dementia. Like we said earlier, relationships are critical to a person's well-being. Without human interaction, we physically turn into ourselves. We become detached and withdrawn. Doing the things we need to do for survival become nearly impossible. We'll talk more about some tips and strategies to address these important disruptions throughout today's webinar. Okay, well, well, it feels as if this COVID thing has been going on forever. From a scientific research standpoint, we are still in a relatively early stage. And as yet, we haven't been able to conduct any longitudinal studies that look at large population groups over extended periods of time. So as we've seen, as more studies are conducted, the information we receive changes, which is confusing. Um, but when we're looking at research, new research, it's really important that we always consider the credentials of the researchers and the research institutions, and that we view everything with a critical eye. So the question is, does having dementia increase one's risk of contracting COVID-19? And the answer is not a simple one. Let's take a look at, at some of the early studies. So in the beginning, we really were relying on the Chinese um, for a lot of our information because they um, identified this pathogen much earlier than we did. So a study that was released this past March by the Chinese Society of Geriatric Psychiatry and the um, Alzheimer's Association of China, they claimed that while dementia itself doesn't contribute to the susceptibility to COVID, there are other coexisting factors that come into play that increase the risk of infection, such as age, comorbidities, and environment. And by the way, we'll look at all of those in the next slide. In May, 
we heard from a research team from, from the University of Exeter in the UK and, and the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. They linked an Alzheimer's risk gene with severe symptoms of COVID-19. So according to the researchers, having this faulty gene could double the risk of developing severe COVID-19. And, and they said, quote, in conclusion, this gene increases risks of severe COVID-19 infection, independent of pre-existing dementia, cardiovascular disease, and type two diabetes. Quite different from that early Chinese study. And then just last month, in August, um, the CDC released a statement saying that according to public health and clinical experts, older adults and people with serious underlying medical conditions are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. And that's, that's something that we've kind of accepted all along. It, it makes sense, okay? It's kind of common sense. But what they included in the list of serious underlying medical conditions are neurologic conditions such as dementia. So basically, again, the CDC includes dementia along with the age-related conditions and comorbidities such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, COPD like emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and a weakened immune system. And as we know, the more underlying medical conditions someone has, the greater their risk is for severe illness from COVID-19. So are people with dementia at higher risk for contracting COVID-19? And are their symptoms worse? Yes, but we still don't conclusively know if the risk is increased by the physiological brain changes caused by that specific Alzheimer's risk gene if it's a combination of age-related diseases and conditions, or if it's from other contributing cognitive and behavioral factors that we see in dementia. Um, so let's take a look at some of these other factors that may increase the risk of COVID infection. And of course, we need to consider some common dementia-related behaviors. So the more anxious, frightened, and confused the person living with dementia is, the more we're gonna see that lack of impulse control, resistance to care, increased agitation, and possibly aggression, wandering. All of these can contribute to situations that increase the risk of infection. We always have to remember that these behaviors are the way that the person living with dementia is trying to tell us that something is wrong, that there is an unmet need. And we as care partners need to figure out what is it that they need. Another factor that can increase their risk is their inability to follow infection control precautions. Difficulty remembering what to do, proper hand washing, properly covering, covering a cough in the crook of their arm, physically distancing, masks are uncomfortable, in particular, if someone already has a breathing issue. And the wearing of masks is not something that the person is used to doing. They may associate masks, mask wearing with Halloween and criminals. Getting used to new things and rules is always challenging. And we're gonna look at some strategies to help with this in just a minute. Not only do infections impact cognitive functioning, but they also weaken the immune system and predispose someone to contracting another infection. I'm sure you can see how this sets up a vicious cycle. So now it's more important than ever to be sure that we do all the things that can keep our loved ones healthy. Hydration, drinking water, more important than ever. So always have a glass of, or bottle of water available for sips throughout the day eating healthy meals and snacks with a good balance between proteins, fats, and carbs. We're learning more and more that plant-based diets are the best. Um, and getting adequate rest. Naps are great. Um, as a caregiver, as Gia said earlier, it's really important to keep a careful eye on signs and symptoms, not only of COVID, but other infections as well. 
And please be sure that everybody is up to date on vaccinations. The flu shots are out now. Make sure you get it as soon as possible. Pneumonia vaccinations and shingles. And we keep talking about social isolation. This in and of itself can be the catalyst for a rapid decline in physical and mental health, which as you know, are intricately related. So the takeaway from all of this is that having dementia does increase a person's risk of contracting COVID and perhaps causes the person to experience more severe symptoms. But right now, all that matters to us, the care partners, is how we can adapt our strategies and change our behaviors so that we can mitigate or lessen that risk. Adapting seems to be the key word in a lot of this stuff these days. So virtual socializing. There is research to support the fact that the effects of loneliness on health are actually equivalent to having high blood pressure, smoking, or being obese. It can contribute to increased susceptibility to illnesses, hospitalizations, and premature death. So while minimizing the chance of infection, we need to simultaneously minimize the negative impact of socialization. We've got to strike a careful balance between physical safety and mental and social health. They are so intricately related. Virtual activities, we have to keep our bodies and our minds active. The link that you see on your screen, that you will see on your screen eventually, uh, I don't see that link anywhere. So there's a link, it will be in your resources, but it's actually comfortintheirjourney.com. And what it is, is it has hundreds of links from Andrew Lloyd, Andrew Lloyd Webber music to scenes from zoos all around the world. And by the way, it can be sometimes helpful to put on closed captioning if a person living with dementia has hearing issues or headphones plugged into the computer can work well too, especially noise canceling headphones so that whoever's wearing them can really focus on what they're listening to. Speaking of headphones, music is the only known thing to activate all areas of the brain. So to evoke emotions and assist with processing them. Remember that we mentioned earlier that responsiveness to music is one of the brain abilities that's not damaged by dementia and re remains until the very end of life. Music can be used to activate a sense of everything from energy to joy to calm. There are also some TV channels that play spa music accompanied by images and even sounds of nature. This combination can create a sense of safety for all of us. Okay. <laughs> Creative truths. So because a person with dementia struggles with understanding and logic, sometimes we need to be creative in our explanations. And the rationale for this, it's better to be kind than correct. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, prior to COVID, I was able to spend a lot of time with my aunt, my mom's twin sister, who lives in a nursing home. She's 100 now and has vascular dementia. She can't remember that my mom passed away six years ago. So we'd have the same conversation at every weekly visit. She would ask, have you seen your mom lately? And then I would pause and I'd say, oh, auntie, I am so sorry, mom passed away. And my aunt would be shocked, but I would be able to comfort her by saying, I know, I miss her so much too. We would both cry a little bit, hug, and then I'd be able to distract her with another question or a comment and we can move on. That strategy always really worked well. But now um, I can only see her on Zoom. And that strategy no longer works because I can't hug and comfort her. So now when she asks if I've seen my mom, I'll say something like, I'll check in on her later today. This satisfies my aunt and she doesn't become distressed. 
And that's really important because I'm not there to comfort her. So how do you talk with your loved one about the pandemic? Because it's really scary, even for those of us who fully understand the situation. Your strategies for everything regarding communicating with your loved one has to be based on how well you know your loved one and what you think they can handle. Okay, the key is to do whatever it takes for your individual situation to minimize any distress. So now to keep my aunt from undue anxiety, I never use the word pandemic or quarantine. Instead, I say something like oh, that dumb virus that's going around is making everybody sick and we have to be extra cautious. And then I immediately need to reassure her that everybody in the family is healthy because we've all been really, really careful. So we mentioned the challenges of mask wearing earlier. So when wearing a mask, be sure to use a calm voice, smile with your eyes. Difficulty with communication and confusion can be further compounded by hearing loss, which is pretty common in the elderly. I know that's the case with my aunt. Um, so these days on Zoom, um, even though she can see our faces, uh, she can't always hear us really well. So I have a lot of little signs already printed up because I know what questions she's going to ask. She's going to ask the same ones over and over. So I have my answers ready to go and she can still read. Yay. Um, so since um, many rely on lip reading then and facial expressions, the masks um, cause some real issues with that. You've probably seen those masks that have the little clear plastic um, inserts over the mouth area. It's a great idea, but I have heard that normal breathing causes the plastic to fog up. And there you go. So what about plastic face shields? So I have an example of an alternative one. We're used to seeing the ones that have kind of a headband and they come straight down. Um, this is one that was recommended by a friend. Um, they're designed primarily for people in food service or hair salons, and they may not offer as much protection as a cloth mask, and their efficacy has not been tested. However, actually on the CDC website, um, the CDC says that in the case of communicating with individuals who are either hearing impaired and rely on lip reading or those with dementia who rely on facial expressions, it may be an acceptable alternative and certainly does provide some protection. You know, in particular, this one, because the, the shield goes all the way back almost to your ears and it's secured down here um, on the chin. As I said, this one was recommended by actually a friend of a friend who is a reading specialist. And she says they work really, really well and don't fog up. So with regards to um, infection control, since understanding language and remembering our concerns with those who have dementia, we can use pictures and graphics to reinforce our message. When verbal language is compromised, pictures really do work. So here are a couple of examples of posters that can help you reinforce these new behaviors and remind the person with dementia to wash their hands, cover their mouths with coughs and sneezes. Um, I like these because they're simple and fun, but I don't think they're too childish. I know with my aunt, when I'm choosing puzzles, you know, things, activities for her, I really have to be careful that I don't insult her intelligence because she'll say to me, you know, I'm not a child. And so I really have to make sure that I, ha I find things that are easy enough for her to understand, but not insulting. I thought these were really cute. So again, you always have to figure out what it is, what works with your loved one because you know, know them better than anybody else. And um, these I found on a website that's a health uh, resources website called Two Can Ed. And um, if you're interested in these, um, you know, if you want to use one of these for your own personal use, you can probably um, take a screenshot 
of it. And that's what I did. And I actually got permission from Toucan Ed to do so. But if you want to use these in business, probably the most ethical thing would be to go onto their website and purchase them. I'm going to show you one more from Toucan Ed. Um, remember how we said that social niceties, social chit chat are ingrained skills that tend to remain. A lot of seniors, especially men, are conditioned to shake hands. I know my mom was a hugger and a toucher. She always touched people's arms, even strangers, made me crazy as a kid. But anyway, these are hard habits to break. And this poster kind of shows some fun alternatives that we might try instead. And then the CDC has lots of free posters that you can print directly from their website. And then I found this other one. I thought it was kind of fun. Um, the We Can Do It taste, take on mask wearing um, might appeal to those with World War II connections. So pictures work well, not only for the person living with dementia, but the caregiver. They can hopefully reduce the numbers of time you have to give reminders and say the same things over and over. A simple pointing to the poster may be all you need to do. All right, Gia. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about modifying our behaviors. Um, it's really important that you be aware of the typical COVID symptoms, but also aware that the person living with dementia may not exhibit typical COVID-19 symptoms. So anytime you see a sudden change in behavior, suspect some kind of infection, remember the person living with dementia may be unable to verbally tell you that they're in pain or have other symptoms. So it's really important to watch their behavior. If you suspect COVID or another infection, be sure to call your care provider for guidance. You may not have worried very much about disinfecting and sanitizing your home previously, but now is the time for all of us to step up our game. And since some disinfectants can be harmful to sensitive skin or toxic if swallowed, be sure that you're extra careful using and storing them. Media consumption. You know, these days, a lot of what's in the news and in the media is disturbing. It can cause a person distress. So try limiting the amount of time that that sort of thing is out in the open. Try not to keep the news on for background noise. Persons living with dementia have challenges with distortion. So imagine if you were sitting in a chair watching the news on TV and you saw all these protests and riots going on with fire and shooting. You may not realize that it's on the TV and not happening nearby you. You may think it's happening right outside your front door. That's not only disconcerting, it's downright scary. Additionally, maintaining routine is even more essential for both your loved one and for yourself. Your loved one needs to know what to expect as much as possible each day. So posting a daily calendar can provide a sense of security and even possibly reduce anxiety and agitation. <clears throat> some of your routines may have been disrupted by COVID, so you may need to establish some new ones. For example, if you went out to lunch every Tuesday, you may want to do a picnic in your house or in your yard instead. Order food from the places that you used to routinely go to. You could even set up a space in your home and call it your cafe. Hey, gee, I want to offer a little example of that. Um, mm -hmm. A friend of mine uh, used to visit her dad in a memory care facility every morning, and she would take him out for coffee and a donut. So she can't take him out on these little outings anymore. So instead, um, she'll buy his coffee and his donut every morning. She'll drop him off at the facility. And she writes a note on the donut bag that says, here's your donut, dad, I love you. And the staff at the facility tells her that he always carries around the empty bag with the note on it. And he shares with others that his daughter loves him. What a great adjustment to the way that we have to live. So this, yeah, this whole thing is forcing us to really think outside of the box, be creative and come up with new strategies. 
And then, oops, here's that self-care thing again. <laughs> if you haven't been focusing on self-care, again, it's never too late to start. Make that one of your regular behaviors. Um, it's been said that you can't water flowers from an empty watering can. And we'll talk more about self-care at the end of the webinar. Okay, um, in these COVID times, everything is more complicated and takes more time. Things we used to take for granted may no longer be available or take much longer to access. As a care partner, you really do need to be prepared for the worst. And none of us likes to think about this. It seems to be human nature to procrastinate when it comes to completing unpleasant tasks. And planning for the unexpected is time consuming. And we tend to rationalize, why should we go through all of this trouble for something that may never happen? But sadly, when we're providing care for elderly loved ones, in particular those with dementia, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So I encourage you to start thinking about this now. And I'm gonna repeat some information from one of my earlier webinars. Um, but just like our broken record on the importance of self-care, we have to keep emphasizing the importance of planning for a crisis. So who's gonna take care of your loved one if you're no longer able to do so for whatever reason? So just like we designate guardians for our kids should something happen to us, we actually need to do the same for our elderly loved ones. And while this doesn't have to be in your will or living trust like we do with our kids, you do need to discuss this with family and friends and have someone or more than one on standby at a moment's notice. And it means that not only do you have to have a power of attorney in place, but it's not a bad idea to have an, alter an alternate listed should something happen to you. So for example, my aunt, the one I've been telling you about, only has one son. So I'm listed as an alternate on documents so that I can make decisions regarding her care should he be unable to do so. Your emergency to-go kits are not only for your backup caregivers, but they're essential to have on hand should an emergency arise and your loved one needs urgent medical care or to be hospitalized. And then always please check out home care agencies before you need them. And there's a good chance that you may need them. Um, a good place to start um, with home care agencies, and I'm actually gonna talk just a little bit more about these in a couple of slides, but a good place to start for lots of info on home care agencies is on checking out a blog that I wrote, and it's gonna be on the Hope Hospice web blog website. So here are some items that I think are really important to include in your emergency plan. And by the way, there is a printable copy of this document included with our resources for this webinar. So while you can certainly keep all of this information on your computer or in your phone, keep in mind that it needs to be easily accessible by your backup caregivers or emergency medical personnel. So I do recommend that you also print it out, make sure it's up to date, and put it in a folder marked important information. So your folder should include personal information about the care recipient, up-to-date medications lists, their medical providers, who the emergency contacts are, including you, their daily routine. This is really important for those with dementia, the daily routine. Gia was talking earlier about the importance of maintaining routines. Um, it should also show your backup caregiver where to find all the legal and financial documents if necessary, just in case you're out of commission for an extended period of time. Also, since you may have sensitive information in this folder, make sure that you only share it with those you trust. And again, a printable copy of this, this document is in our resources. So earlier, I mentioned the importance of investigating home care. There may come a time when you need to rely on paid help and it's important to do your homework and research the agencies. Ideally, again, before you need them. 
If you wait for a crisis situation, the crisis is going to make your decisions for you. So ask friends, neighbors, family, um, your physician's office for recommendations. Your local senior centers may also be a really good resource. Or me. Send me an email request and I can give you a few names <clears throat> if you're interested in this right now. Excuse me. <clears throat> Many agencies are now training their caregivers in caring for patients with dementia. A few in our area are senior helpers, comfort care, visiting angels, and comfort keepers. I'm sure there are others, um, so always ask when you're looking at agencies. It's been my experience <clears throat> that if they do provide dementia training, that information is right there on the homepage of their website because it's something they're proud of. If the caregiver knows how to interact and communicate with your loved one, your life will be so much easier. Um, you'll feel more comfortable having them in your home and your loved one will be less likely to fire them when you're not looking. And yes, that does happen. Be sure to ask for a copy of the agency's COVID-19 protocols. So I recently thought, you know what, I'm gonna call an agency and ask the owner some questions about this. So here's what he told me. And I would like to make the assumption this is true for all agencies, but I do recommend, again, that you call them and ask these questions. So he told me that their caregivers are always given the option as to whether they're comfortable working with a COVID positive client. If they're not, then another caregiver um, will be requested. So caregivers are never forced to do this to keep their jobs. All of the staff receive extensive training on how to keep themselves safe, their own families safe, and how to keep their clients and their clients' families safe. And this includes wearing full personal protective equipment, masks, face shields if necessary, gloves and gowns. And by the way, these all should be single use items. Now, if the caregiver is working with a COVID positive client, they will not be allowed to work with any other clients. And that makes so much sense. And the other thing that I was so happy to hear is that this agency does provide two weeks of paid sick leave. This is important because the last thing we want is for someone to come into our homes who is sick simply because they can't afford not to work. So again, when you're checking out agencies in advance, be sure to ask about all of this. Okay, I may sound like a germaphobe here, but I'm not really. Um, but I do recommend that you be proactive and screen anyone who comes into your home, whether it be your paid caregiver, family, friends, neighbors, workers. This can reduce the chances of anybody bringing COVID into your home. So have one of those touchless thermometers on hand, request permission to take the person's temperature prior to them entering your home and their temperature does need to be less than 100.4 degrees. This is not fail safe, as some people do not run fevers, and, someone, and some who have COVID are asymptomatic. However, it's one of the screening measures. Also, ask if the person has taken a fever-reducing medication, such as Tylenol, within an hour, because these meds may mask a COVID-related fever. Ask if they've been exposed to anyone who's tested positive and ensure that your paid, giver, paid caregiver is wearing clean PPE. For anyone else who comes to visit, insist that they wear masks. Purchase some, have some on hand. So I always keep some of these disposable um, medical grade masks available. Um, they look like this, single use, got them on Amazon and they're about 50 cents each. Have a hand washing station set up in your house with soap, it doesn't need to be antibacterial, and paper towels for drying hands. Ask everyone to wash their hands upon entering. For paid caregivers, have a convenient place where they can wash their hands regularly throughout the day. And by the way, proper hand washing is better than sanitizer, but you can certainly use sanitizer if need be. So again, all of these precautions should be followed for anyone coming into your home. 
even friends and family, especially if there are vulnerable people in your house. And if you feel uncomfortable giving your friends and family the third degree when they come to visit, I always blame it on the doctor. Say, my doctor says that I have to do this because we're at higher risk. Okay, facility placement. This is always a tricky one. If your loved one lives in a residential care facility, such as assisted living, skilled nursing, board and care, you may face what may seem to be insurmountable challenges. You're prohibited from visiting, assisting with care, and providing that much needed support and companionship. We see stories in the news about how nursing homes are hotspots for the coronavirus. We worry if our loved ones are safe. Is the facility following proper infection control protocol? Is the staff healthy? Are they testing regularly? Should we bring our loved ones home? These are all legitimate, rational concerns. So I was my mom's care partner when she lived in an assisted living facility and then ultimately skilled nursing. And while I didn't physically live with her, I did spend hours each day with her. Facility staff are doing all they can to provide quality care, but there's nothing that can replace the loving connections and hugs from family and friends. And of course, our loved ones who live in facilities may feel as if they're being abandoned and we, their care partners, feel as if we are abandoning them. We can't help but feeling guilty. I'm experiencing those emotions right now with my aunt. The fact that she has dementia makes it even more difficult as I try to explain to her that her family has not abandoned her. Um, fortunately, we have standing Zoom visits with her twice a week and that seems to work pretty well. The key to being a successful advocate for your loved one in a facility is to be sure that the staff know who you are, the squeaky wheel phenomenon, and you need to know who they are and how to contact them. You may find that the social worker and activities directors may be the best sources to help you find those connections with your loved ones. Facilities should be sending regular updates through the mail, email, and uh, phone calls or texts for urgent concerns. Be sure they have accurate contact info for you and other responsible parties just in case. As the counties begin reopening, it's important for us to stay on top of the changes. A really important change that's recently gone into effect in California are the visitation rights in long-term care facilities. That's skilled nursing, assisted living, um, board and care facilities. There are specific guidelines for both indoor and outdoor visits. But in general, visits are allowed, this is new, if the facility meets specific criteria, such as there's no current outbreak or cases in that facility, and that's been the case for the last 14 days, um, they're seeing declining cases in the community, they have no staffing shortages, and they do have an adequate testing plan in place. So be aware that every county in California may be different, and restrictions can vary from facility to facility. So I just got a letter from my aunt's, actually an email from my aunt's skilled nursing facility in Castro Valley, that they may now allow visits under special circumstances. And by the way, uh, since this started in March, they have only had one staff test positive and no residents have tested positive. And that really puts our minds at ease. Anyway, so I'm gonna read you an, an excerpt from the letter. So quote, therefore, in accordance with CMS guidelines, restrictions will continue. And I must remind you that we must be cautious and conservative in allowing in-person visits. The reopening recommendations maintain that visitation should only be allowed for compassionate care situations. Compassionate care situations refer not only to end of life situations, but could also refer to some unique circumstances where a visit from a family member would be consistent with the term. This can be determined, determined on a case-by-case -case discussion involving the interdisciplinary team and the family members. So, end quote. I was really excited to read that um, because I gotta tell you, if you have a distressed loved one with dementia whose health is declining 
due to that isolation, not seeing you, I certainly think that easily qualifies as a special circumstance. So I'm gonna give you a couple of resources here um, to find out more about this. California Advocates for New Nursing Home Reform, or CANR, um, one of my very favorite go-to resources, um, has prepared a summary of all of these new visitation guidelines that were effective at the end of August. Now this is just for California. So um, a copy of this, there's a link to this document that's on your resource page. Um, and then the national organization, Visitation Saves Lives. Um, this is an organization that advocates for an effort to restore what they call reasonable visitation to residents in long-term care facilities. This organization believes that, quote, the harms caused by cutting residents off from visitors have become unbearable. Residents throughout the country are suffering profound social isolation, frustration, and neglect, end quote. So if your loved one lives in a facility, please check with the director of nursing to see how that facility is interpreting and following these visitation guidelines. And these have been established by the California State Department of Public Health and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So again, this is where you need to be an advocate. Um, check these out, ask a lot of questions and do what you need to do to keep your loved one as safe as possible. So I just wanted to share with you one of the ways that my family is staying connected with my aunt and doing all we can do to let her know that we haven't abandoned her. So not to sound like an infomercial, but I learned of the skylight photo frame uh, from a webinar that I recently attended that was given by the Family Caregiver Alliance, another one of my very favorite resources. Um, so I know these digital frames have been around for a long time, but what I really liked about this one was the ease with which anybody can upload photos to the frame from anywhere. So instead of uploading it to the actual device, you upload it via a special email that's connected to the frame. And I like how easy it is to view the photos, even for somebody with dementia. dementia. Um, I've set it to shuffle the pictures so that a new one comes up every 45 seconds. I know that sounds like a long time, but since my aunt has dementia, it takes her longer to process things visually. Um, the staff turns the device on in the morning and off at night. And I actually ask them to include those instructions in her care plan. So that's something that they have to do. I initially uploaded about 60 photos on the frame. One from I mean, as early as her baby picture, some of her baby pictures and her wedding picture and things like that up to current day. Um, by the way, the frames hold about 8,000 files. So I dropped it off with the activity director. Unfortunately, I obviously I couldn't go in at that point. He connected it to the Wi-Fi in the facility and my aunt was immediately able to look at the pictures. Um, I gave her unique um, skylight email address to everyone in the family. And now they're all sending pictures to the, device, to the device. The kids can do it straight from their phones. Um, there's no cost after the initial purchase. Again, I know I sound like an infomercial. Um, I did get the upgrade for 40 bucks a year because that way we can send videos as well. And we can also label the photos. And for my aunt with dementia, labeling is good because she can't always remember some of the people that are in the pictures. So my aunt, the uh, activity director sent me this picture that I just put up on the screen. That's my aunt sitting at her little table looking at her, her new photo frame. They say that she loves it. Um, so also one last thing, in addition to photos, um, I've even updated, excuse me, I've even uploaded some little messages for her. Um, so kind of interspersed in these randomly appearing pictures, you know, she can see little things like, you know, we love you, auntie, um, and whatever somebody wants to put in. Okay, enough of my stuff. Gia, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> that was all really good stuff, though. Okay, so Amia, advanced dementia and hospitalizations. If your loved one has advanced dementia, 
and needs to be hospitalized for COVID or another serious medical condition, make sure that hospital staff know how necessary it is for them to communicate with you. The CARE Act mandates that patients or their designee, which is most likely you, can identify a caregiver, notify that caregiver when the patient is to be discharged, and provide information and instructions on the patient's needs and medications following the discharge. COVID further complicates all of this. You've got to make the decision about your own safety, especially if you're in that vulnerable group, as well. Even if you are able to accompany your loved one to the hospital, is that the wisest thing for you to be doing? The safest thing for your health? Depending on the circumstances, you may need to stay with your loved one and will need to wear full PPE and follow hospital guidelines. We just have to be willing to do the things that we're being requested to do in order to be safe and provide quality care. Because your loved one may be anxious, frightened, and agitated. And actually, you most likely will be too. But it's essential that you project an air of calm. Remember, the person living with dementia can read your emotions. Since you'll be wearing a mask, be sure that your eyes are smiling, your body's relaxed, and you speak in a soothing and reassuring tone of voice. Be aware as well that you and healthcare providers may face difficulties caring for your loved one because they may not want to cooperate with care. They may not want to follow personal protective measures such as wearing a mask or practicing social distancing like we talked about before. They may refuse diagnostic procedures. If at all possible, you might wanna to try to practice some of these things at home. Just depends on your personal circumstances. In this case, in any case, do as much as you can or as much as you are allowed to, to help the person living with advanced dementia to follow CDC guidance. Try to prepare in advance for strategies to help your loved one feel safe and secure. Bring soothing music on your phone, have topics of conversation, ready at the, at the get-go for distractions. Comfort food is one of my favorite go-tos. My grandmother loved homemade clam chowder, but it wasn't just about the taste of the chowder. She and my grandfather used to go to the beach and get the clams themselves. The chowder would simmer on the stove all afternoon and just the smell of chowder cooking would elicit emotions for her of the good times they had had together. And it was easy to get her reminiscing. Now, I recognize it's not exactly something appropriate to do to bring food into a hospital. However, my point to the story is to point out how powerful a smell can be to not only calm a person, but also to trigger memories and emotions that might be beneficial. Remember the five senses, smell, taste, sight, hearing, and touch. These senses remain active late into dementia. So finding ways to create positive emotions via the senses can be very beneficial. Okay. Favorite foods, like we talked about, pictures of loved ones, even if they don't know who they are, some part of their brain may recognize that, we, that they know them and that those people are comforting. A familiar voice, get creative, yeah. keeping in mind what, me, what might be comforting for your individual loved one. A connection can be made sometimes with the simplest of gestures. Okay, such great information. So hospitalization or comfort care? You may be thinking, and rightly so, that should your loved one contract COVID or need to be hospitalized for another serious condition, you don't want them to be alone in the hospital. And that's what we hear about often in hospitals and nursing homes. So a couple of things here to consider. One, compassionate care guidelines that are now in place and regulated by state and federal agencies do permit loved ones to visit in a facility or a hospital if death is imminent. If your loved one is on hospice, they can have hospice care in the facility and loved ones can be with them, usually within limits, and usually one visitor at a time. Two, as Debbie mentioned earlier, 
counties begin re as counties begin reopening and some restrictions are being loosened, you might want to check to see what's actually happening in the current moment. Now, the compassionate care guidelines are being expanded to cover special circumstances where the patient's health and well-being are dependent on a caregiver. So that's a good thing. If your loved one is hospitalized, please ask to talk with the medical social worker. There will be one in particular who is assigned to your floor. And you can review the case and find out the most current regulations and brainstorm a little bit about what you might be able to do to provide the best, best care and reassurance. Three, should your loved one need to be hospitalized due to COVID it, or another serious condition, it's important to discuss the pros and the cons with your loved one's physician, especially if your loved one has a COVID diagnosis. And hopefully you've already had the discussion with your loved one about their wishes at end of life. And hopefully they have an advanced directive in place. Most of you are probably familiar with advanced healthcare directives, but PULSTs are also legal documents that enable one to express their end of life wishes care. These legal documents vary slightly state by state and have slightly different names. In California, we have the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or POLST. Usually POLSTs are put into place when someone with a serious illness enters a nursing home or is hospitalized. POLSTs have very specific instructions for medical treatment, and they do include DNRs. You may want to, include, you may want to keep your loved one at home rather than sending them to the hospital. You may choose palliative care which is a type of care that focuses on comfort and quality of life over aggressive medical treatments. Although the person may choose to have medical interventions should a situation arise. Hospice care is for people who have serious and advanced medical conditions with a life expectancy of six months or less and who want to focus on comfort and quality of life during the time that remains. Hospice care does require an order from a physician. Both hospice and palliative care are covered by Medicare and your insurance. Okay. So just like everything else, hospice care has been modified to meet the CDC guidelines for keeping everyone safe. Whether the care is provided in the person's home, a care facility, or a hospital. And by the way, most hospice care in the US is provided in the patient's home. So after being re referred by a physician for hospice services, the patient is visited by a hospice nurse for an evaluation and a care plan is developed. Now in pre-COVID times, the hospice's interdisciplinary team of nurses, physicians, social workers, chaplains, aides, and volunteers would visit in person to offer care and support to patients and their families. But during the pandemic, things have had to, be, had to be changed a little bit. So most agencies, including Hope Hospice, continue to provide this patient and family-centered care with some important changes that are designed to reduce the risk of exposure to all involved, whether it be the patients, the families, and the hospice staff. So in-person visits are conducted during the initial enrollment process and to manage any uncontrolled symptoms that may arise. Hospice staff who visit follow the CDC recommendations regarding personal protective equipment, so masks, gloves, gowns. Our nurses are checked for COVID symptoms prior to visiting a patient, and the patients each time are asked a series of questions to rule out possible COVID infection, again, prior to each in-person visit by a nurse. Now the other services um, that used to be in person, um, such as social work, spiritual care, may be offered remotely through video visits, telephone check-ins, medications may be delivered by a local pharmacy. Hospice support staff who are available 24 hours a day through a helpline are skilled at managing calls and providing appropriate care. If an emergent situation arises, such as a new uncontrolled symptom, 
the hospice team will assess how to manage the circumstances, which again may involve a home visit. Hospice agencies, again, must be in compliance with Medicare and county and state public health departments. But please be assured that during these, despite these necessary um, COVID precautions, the interdisciplinary team, including our bereavement services, they continue to offer the compassionate care that hospice is known for. So should the situation arise and you need to find a hospice provider, um, you can always contact, go onto the website of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. And by the way, it's your right to choose whatever hospice agency you wish. And I do encourage you to do your research before selecting an agency because the quality of care can vary from agency to agency. Now, a really excellent resource um, is the Medicare website, Care Compare. And here you can find hospice agencies in your area. All you do is plug in your zip code. Um, and you can also see how they're rated um, by Medicare. So really important information to have. Okay, so here is our promised plug for self-care. Caregiver self-care is a priority. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and it's re for me, for most of us, it's really difficult to do. <laughs> In every webinar that we've done over the past month, couple of months, we've been stressing the importance of this. And for those of you that have listened to our other webinars, I apologize for the repetition, but understand how strongly we feel about this. Here's a couple of resources that have been talked about in those previous classes. For those of us who have a hard time finding even a couple of minutes to provide ourselves with self-care, check out Jane Travis's article on self-care in five minutes or less. You see, you have no excuses if it's five minutes or less. Jane is a British therapist and she provides not only suggestions, but links to other resources. We also recommend that you take a look at a post on Hope's website from Kathleen Brand. She's our Director of Bereavement Services. Kathleen provides some very helpful information for all of us, even if we're not currently caregivers. By the way, keep in mind these links to these sites are going to be listed on our resources page. Okay, the term respite refers to taking a break. And in this case, making sure that caregivers can take a break, which, as Gia mentioned, is not always easy to manage. Ideally, family, friends, and neighbors can help with care for your loved ones. But these days, that's not as easy as it used to be. So you may find a time where you need to rely on those paid caregivers. I know I talked about that previously, but you may need to rely on them to give you a break, and that's a possibility. Paid caregivers don't need to just come in to provide personal care for your loved one. They can be there um, to stay with your loved one while you leave to run errands, or while you go to another room to take a nap, or to meditate, or to do whatever it is you need to do. Um, the cost in our area is pretty expensive. Um, it's somewhere between 18 and $30 an hour, and they usually do have a two to four hour minimum. But there are some um, options for those with restricted incomes. So every county has an area agency on aging. Again, this is one of my go-to referral and resources. Um, and again, especially good for those um, you know, who have some low income situations. Um, these agencies are usually tied to the county's social services department and they provide free and low cost services for absolutely everything related to caring for seniors, even respite for the caregivers. So you can get a link to the agency in your county by accessing the national site, which is n4a.org. And then also the Alzheimer's Association on their website, there is an excellent article that covers everything you need to know about respite care. 
and I have a direct link to that article on your resource page. And then lastly, virtual support groups. If you're caring for a loved one with dementia, one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to join a support group. Even if you're not a support group person, this is a really good thing. Now in person, of course, is ideal, but these days we have to rely on the virtual ones. So I've listed three trusted options for you to explore. The Family Caregiver Alliance, which again is just an absolutely amazing resource for so many things. Um, and they do have online support groups that I completely trust. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, which used to have in-person support groups, um, have now converted their support groups to online as well. And then the other place that's a good resource um, are local senior centers. They can either direct you to an online um, support group or what I've been discovering is the local senior centers in our areas are now running their own online support groups. And I've heard really good things in particular about the, um, uh, the program in Pleasanton, the senior center in Pleasanton. So make sure that you always check out the safety and security of whatever group you join. Um, you always need to be sure that your identity is protected from potential scammers. So in closing, a reminder that the best way to care for your loved ones is to care for yourself. And always remember, it's not selfish to take that break to do something that you love, something that's fun, something that's just for you. It's not selfish, it's self-care. First question may be for you, Debbie. Okay, let me, let me pull that up. Uh, so the first one? I'm looking at amending the trust document. Yeah, good question. How, how to amend the trust document for alternate power of attorney in case the primary caregiver is unable to make the decisions for the spouse with dementia. Do the adult children listed in the trust, or probably means so the adult children listed in the trust can make decisions. So because I'm not a lawyer, and I'm always uncomfortable offering really specific legal advice. On October 15th, we're going to have a presentation by an elder law specialist, Julie, um, Julie Fiedler. So I would encourage you um, to do one of two things. Number one, Watch our, our um, attend our webinar, and you'll be able to ask Julie these really specific questions. Or if you need that information sooner than next month, I would recommend just contacting um, Julie at Horizon Elder Law. Just go to their website, Horizon Elder Law. It's in San Ramon. So I'm sorry, I can't provide you that question, but I'm not a lawyer here. Okay. So another question that we have is what tests are given to get the diagnosis for dementia? I think that my mom is exhibiting signs. Great that you are paying attention and you've seen some things that concern you and you want to get some advice and some help. I think the first step would be to visit either your primary care physician or if you're able to go to a neurologist. They, both of these doctors have tests that they can do to figure out whether it's normal aging or not normal aging. They're also going to ask you a lot of baseline questions, so it's going to be really important for you to be able to tell them what is what behaviors are different. Um, I am happy to chat through this with you offline, privately, if you want to email me and we can talk a little bit further about moving forward with, with some of those steps. I will, thanks for everybody. Uh, I, I hope everybody stays healthy and well. Okay, take good care. Bye-bye.